Good afternoon. My name is Terry Osborne of McBride Rare Books, and I am the ABAA's liaison for the Bibliographical Society of America. This afternoon, I have the pleasure to present to you Denise Gigante of Stanford University, giving the talk, Bibliography, Bibliophilia, and Bibliomania in 19th Century America. Denise Gigante teaches British Romantic literature and poetry over a longer tradition. Her interests include poetic form and aesthetics, bibliomania and literary antiquarianism, gastronomy, the history and form of the essay, material print culture, and the mixed media work of William Blake. She is currently completing work on the Cambridge history of the British essay, a monumental history of the development of the genre by a global network of authors that includes her own chapter on books, the bibliographical essay. She is also working to complete The Mental Traveler, William Blake, a study of Blake's illuminated poetry in relation to late medieval and Renaissance Christian iconography and the literary tradition of pilgrimage in a heavily illustrated volume to be published as part of the Clarendon Lecture Series by Oxford University Press. Her most recently published book is Book Madness, a story of book collectors in America from Yale University Press this year. It is a narrative experiment in literary history that explores different pockets of book collecting in mid 19th century America. The story is based on the sale of Charles Lamb's antiquarian books, a quintessential book lover's library in New York in 1848. She is also the author of The Keats Brothers, The Life of John and George from Harvard UP 2011, Life, Organic Form and Romanticism from Yale UP 2009, Taste, A Literary History, Yale UP 2005, and two anthologies, The Great Age of the English Essay, Yale UP 2008, and Gusto, Essential Writings in 19th Century Gastronomy from Rutledge 2005, as well as numerous articles and book chapters on topics of interest from taste and gastronomy to book collecting and poetic form. Please join me in welcoming Denise Gigante. Okay, thank you so much for that generous. I, I know it sounds like a diverse and possibly unconnected feel, uh, array of interests, but they all connect somehow. Um, so today I wanted to talk about the phenomenon of bibliography as it relates both to the science of bibliography or identifying, cataloging, um, and sort of uh, selling and acquiring books as part of what was a mid-19th mid century phenomenon of all of America's more or less institutional libraries rising up in the 1840s, it, well, really beginning in the 1830s, uh, heating up in the 1840s through the 1850s. Um, and then bibliography as a form of writing about books and book collecting, and so the theory, in a sense, of collecting. So if we start with uh, this guy, Henry Stevens of Vermont, GMB stands for Green Mountain Boy. He was very pleased with his American heritage. He was probably the person responsible for sending most books across the Atlantic in both directions. Um, more than any other uh, bookseller in the 19th century. He built the uh, American collection of books at the British Library. So any book related to America, printed in America, old books about America. Um, and he simultaneously stocked Amer American collectors with the books that now make up a large array of different kinds of institutional um, uh, collections. Um, at the time, we should keep in mind that America was way behind Europe in book collecting. So at mid-century, the largest library in the United States was the Harvard College Library, and it had 72,000 volumes. Um, but its model really was Cambridge University, which had, you know, more than double that, 166,724 volumes. 
And Britain was behind the continent by far in book collecting. So we have the University of Göttingen Library with 360,000 books. Um, it should also be noted that when uh, one of the people, uh, bibliographers in my book, Joseph Green Cogswell, who was responsible for really the New York Public Library, um, came back from the University of Göttingen where he had studied, he introduced to the, he became the Harvard librarian and he introduced the card catalog system to the US. Before that, libraries had printed lists of books. And you know, all the way from the smallest libraries to the British Museum, we're still working with these lists. Um, so he introduced the flexible system of the uh, card catalog. Um, if you compare, say, national collections, the Library of Congress, which was founded by an act of Congress uh, in 1846, had 50,000 books, compared to the British Library in the British Museum at the time had 435,000. And then double that, again, if we look across the channel at the National Library in Paris. Um, these, these, these collections have been growing for a much, much longer time. So American book dealers and collectors were out-competed in, in um, a, well, we'll go back to that, but a, a whole category of old books. Yale University Library had only 21,000 books, um, many of them mere lumber, according to <laughs> one of their former librarians as opposed to Oxford with 220,000 volumes at mid-century. This is Gore, Library, Gore Hall on the left in 1840. Um, this is the building that was erected after a fire swept through Harvard Hall and destroyed the entire library that had been collecting since the 17th century. So they had to rebegin um, their collection and they were already up to 72,000 uh, within a couple of decades. There were also, as Henry Stevens, who I've shown you, um, pointed out to the British Parliament when he was interviewed at mid-century about public libraries, they were conducting this massive search on public libraries in Europe and the US in order to figure out what they should do. Uh, so he identified, you know, national libraries were serving the public. So the Library of Congress in the Smithsonian, state libraries, town, city, village, and municipal libraries, Athenaeums and Lyceums, which were part of the public self-culture movement of the 1830s and 40s, um, academy or common school libraries, Sunday school and congregational libraries, historical society libraries were a huge one that was growing, antiquarian society libraries, subscription libraries of different kinds, and then mercantile and apprentice libraries. Um, this is the Boston Athenaeum Library on the left, but the mercantile and apprentice libraries were much, much more uh, of, of a big deal at the time than they are now when university libraries and, and free access public libraries have taken over. At the time, it was a way for people who were involved in commerce uh, to have access to books. Um, and so you would have these young men, basically, uh, who would visit mercantile and uh, uh, apprentice libraries after work to improve their, their minds, right? Uh, whether re that meant reading in the reading hall and bumping into other intellectually curious young men or attending lectures or taking classes. You know, the apprentice library in Brooklyn offered all sorts of classes uh, in the model of continuing studies. Mark Twain himself, who worked as a printer in Manhattan, that's how he began his career, uh, wrote to his mother in 1853 saying that the printers have two libraries in town, entirely free to the craft, and in these I can spend my evenings most pleasantly. If books are not good company, where will I find it? He wasn't alone. Uh, a lot of, uh, again, uh, sort of culturally ambitious men, you know, it was really a period when uh, it wasn't enough just to have money, right? You needed also to have cultural ambitions uh, if you were going to be sort of aspiring to enter society. And so the New York Mercantile Library Association, oh, I, sorry, I tacked on an extra library. The New York Mercantile Library Association 
library uh, was a massive, uh, massive enterprise. There were, at mid-century, 27,000 volumes here, accessible through this reading room. And you can see that the architectural style here is geared toward um, inspiring uh, uh, higher ambitions, right? We'll go back to that in the architecture, but you can see it here in the domed, columned dome, the reading room, these were all built in the mid 19th century. George Palmer Putnam, who was one of the most active, if not the most active publisher in New York at the time, spent, when he was a young man, working at a bookshop as a clerk, his after hours at the Mercantile Library in New York. And from his note, he furiously took notes and compiled charts in order to understand history. Uh, Keep in mind, most of these young men uh, stopped school at the age of 14 to go to work. So, you know, if they wanted any sub substantive type of education, they needed to do it on their own. He ended up publishing in 1833 his notes from the Mercantile Library for other people in the form of what he calls chronology, an introduction, an index, universal history, biography, and useful knowledge. And this theme of useful knowledge was everywhere at the time. People were hungry for information, even more than entertainment. Here's the Mercantile Association Library of Boston in 1856. It was slightly behind the New York Commercial Mercantile Library, but not far. Um, uh, this was the Young Men's, is, it's still there, the Young Men's Mercantile Library Association in Cincinnati, founded in 1835 by a group of, you know, working young men, and kept growing in size, and people could meet there at lunch hour to talk about, you know, books or magazines, to do research, etc. and then after hours, they could borrow books, take them home to their families, um, and then again, you get this sense that like there are statues and, and atlases and other pieces of artwork intended to suggest that you know, you're a working person, but you're part of some sort of inherited culture. And then this book uh, in, of 1838 was delivered by, so this book was, began as a lecture by William Ellery Channing. Uh, in Boston, part of the Franklin Lectures. It's called Self Culture, an address introductory to the Franklin Lectures delivered at Boston, September 1838. And this book was so wildly uh, influential in, in terms of um, encouraging self culture uh, that it's always pointed to. It was also always quoted uh, by people who are, say, giving in all, uh, say, annual addresses at the Mercantile Society libraries, people would deliver poems or speeches, and often they would quote this. Um, and the Franklin lectures themselves were part of the self-culture movement. So if you think about Franklin, you know, Franklin was the model for Americans of self-culture. Uh, he started off as a printer, as many people know, uh, and then worked all the way through, became a bookseller, a book writer, a bookmaker, um, was so involved in books that at the age of 22, he wrote his own epitaph uh, as kind of a bibliographical epi epitaph, a new category, right, literary category. The body of B. Franklin printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out, and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here food for worms. But the work shall not be wholly lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more perfect edition, corrected and amended, amended by the author. God, right? So, so this, is a, this, was a, this was a book world, I would say, mid-19th century. Um, one of the collectors that I write about in my book, this book, Book Madness, which is a story of book collectors in the U.S. at mid-century, erected the first monument to Franklin uh, in Boston. There, there, was, there was one already. There was the 
statue of Franklin above the entrance to the Library Company of Philadelphia, which was is often seen as really the first public library um, founded in 1737 in the U.S. Um, and again, here you have have bibliophiles. This guy was a bibliophile. Um, I would call him more of a bibliophile than a bibliomaniac, which is a kind of pathologized version of the bibliophile. Um, so this is the uh, Franklin Memorial. That's in the um, Mount Auburn Cemetery. To the memory of Benjamin Franklin, the printer, the philosopher, the patriot, who by his wisdom blessed his country and his age and bequeathed to the world an illustrious example of industry, integrity, and self-culture. And it's hard to remember how important having inspirations like these was for working men because, you know, at the end of the day, and I keep saying men because, you know, it was working men, but um, you can imagine at the end of the day, you're exhausted. The last thing you want to do is like cram more information and, you know, so, but it, so having ins men of inspiration like this was important. Here's George Livermore, another, he's a bibliomaniac in my story. He collected mainly Bibles in every possible language you could ever imagine, every shape, every size, scrolls, everything. Improve every minute. Uh, this is him writing in 1834 to his younger brother. But do not consider time lost if spent in profitable conversation or even sometimes in silence. There are other ways of improving the mind than reading books. Read men read the volume of nature, read everything you see. But when you take a printed volume, bestow on it your whole attention and read it through before you commence anything else. I'm not sure that Franklin or uh, even say somebody like Samuel Johnson would agree with that way of reading, uh, but you can see how important the whole idea was here. Um, and again, just going back to the architectural effort to uh, inspire Americans with some sense of cultural grandeur, you know, this is the um, reading room of the, of the British Museum, uh, which clearly became a model later for, um, well, we'll see elsewhere, but here's the Astor Library in 1854. This is a precursor of the New York Public Library. It's founded on the... Um, the model of, say, a Byzantine cathedral, uh, light, natural light coming in from a, from a large dome uh, at the top, alcoves down the main nave containing books, uh, stacks of books where people could browse. They couldn't pick out their own books. This is the following on the inspiration of the Astor Library. Uh, Cogswell's friends in Boston quickly uh, worked to open the Boston Public Library, uh, founded by an act of legislature in 1848. And again, you see this idea where you have this long nave with the dome here in this case at the end, natural lighting, et cetera. There's, there's a theme going on. This is the Boston Athenaeum Library, <clears throat> pretty much the same exact model. Again, you can see the alcoves on the side of the nave. This is from the church structure, right, of the little uh, independent uh, chapels. And here's uh, the first librarian of the Boston, uh, uh, superintendent of the Boston Public Library, a great library. The assembled soul of all that men held wise is the sum of all literature. It is more, for neither its mass nor its power is to be measured by counting its volumes. It is an organism in which every part augments the vigor of every other part and of the whole. It has absorbed famous collections around which cluster the memories of illustrious men who through their aid have enriched literature or extended the domain of science. And this pretty much encapsulates um, the idea that people were going for in, in the mid-19th century of erecting public institutions that were more than just a collection of random collection of books donated by people. The idea of system was imported really into the US by Cogswell from, from Göttingen, the librarian of the Astor. And that idea of system, of the library being an organic whole, that there's a sense to it, you know, 
was behind the public library movement of mid-century. Okay, so. <laughs> so now we have, uh, let's see. What time did I? Okay, we're good. Um, so that's one kind of bibliography. And all of the people who really dedicated their lives to making um, information and, and literature uh, accessible to Americans, uh, you know, performed invaluable service to, to education in the United States. There's also another kind of bibliography that's worth talking about in the mid-19th century, and that's uh, the literary art of bibliography, so beyond the catalog. And Charles Lamb was a model for that. Charles Lamb's library was sold in New York in 1848, and so that's the kind of orienting device of my story of book collectors, because so much happened in 1848, it's hard to believe. Uh, but here he is with his books, and Charles Lamb is, was, in America in the 19th century, considered the patron saint of book collectors. Everybody knew and looked up to Lamb. It's shocking. If you look at any almost, I, I almost would challenge you to like f find me wrong in this, but if you look at any major auction that took place in the 19th century, you could have the most spectacular collection of rare books and beautifully bound books, expensive books, but if there were any of Lamb's old books, old ratty books in there, it, they made the front cover or the beginning of the introduction because Lamb provided the language for book collectors to think about books and as unique objects. So, oh, I guess it's also worth, if we're thinking about bibliography as a literary art, Lamb and his fellow essayists, uh, these were the essays that people kind of were reading at the time. You know, Lamb's detached thoughts on books and reading, the two races of men, where he divides the human race into book borrowers and book lenders. Um, Will, <laughs> William Hazlitt's on reading old books, uh, which he, of course, loved and found ways to, well, we'll go back to that. And then on reading new books, which he hated. Um, Lee Hunt wrote about his collection and other people's collections and old books and bookshops and book binding and book stalls, and pretty much the list goes on. Um, but again, just going back to Lamb, people turn to Lamb uh, uh, for his characteristic humor, but also, again, because he provided for the first time, really, a sense of why certain books read better in certain versions. So for Lamb, for example, um, he says, to be strong-backed and neat-bound is the desideratum of a volume. It has to be solid. You don't want it to fall apart. Magnificence comes after. This, when it can be afforded, is not to be lavished upon all kinds of books indiscriminately. I would not dress a set of magazines, for instance, in full suit. The dishabille or half-binding with Russia backs, always, ever, is our costume. And that would be the, uh, you know, as you all know, probably on the right there, the, the half-binding. Um, on the left, you know, the, the, the drab boards of the unbound bound book, but un nobody took that book to the book binder. Um, you know, wasn't as um, uh, substantial, and it certainly would not have gone onto any of the bookshelves of mid-19th century book collectors in the U.S. Uh, he says that a Shakespeare or a Milton, unless the first editions, it were mere foppery to trick out in gay apparel. The possession of them confers no distinction. Uh, the exterior of them, the things themselves being so common, strange to say, raises no sweet emotions, no tickling sense of property in the owner. So you can read, for him, you can read Shakespeare in the most common editions, and that's preferable to reading Shakespeare in a fancy edition. He says, I do not care. He was probably the only person in the 19th century who said, you know, I do not care for a first folio of Shakespeare. A first folio of Shakespeare was the holy grail for literary antiquarians in this country. Um, he says, I rather prefer the common editions of Rowe and Thompson, which are 18th century um, 
uh, 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 bookmaker book sellers who and publishers who produced. You know, today we read the paperback Shakespeare's, the Signets, or the Ardens. They did the version of that for the 18th century, and Lamb preferred them with without notes not scholarly editions, and with plates, illustrations, which, being so execrably bad, serve as maps or modest remembrancers to the text and without pretending to any supposable emulation with it. And therefore, they are so much better than the Shakespeare gallery engravings, which did. So if you take a look here at what he's talking about, on the left, you have the Tonson woodcuts, um, which are so rough and kind of, in Lamb's view, like ridiculous that they really kind of stimulate the imagination. Whereas on the right, um, this is from the Boydell uh, Shakespeare, uh, using illustrations from the Boydell Shakespeare Gallery, a highly expensive edition with fine, fine, fine intaglio etching, top artists. Um, in a sense, this attitude says, look, this is all done. Like, where can the imagination operate? This is from The Winter's Tale, right? When Hermione reveals that she's still alive, she's not really just a statue. Um, so again, I have a community of feeling with my countrymen about the plays, says Lamb, and I like those editions of him which have been oftenest tumbled about and handled. On the contrary, I cannot read Beaumont and Fletcher, but in folio, this being Shakespeare's dramatic contemporary. Um, Thompson's Seasons looks best. I maintain it a little torn and dog's eared. This is a kind of, this is the first really long poem about nature, descriptive poem about nature in English. It's the kind of book you would sit down with on a kind of winter's evening and just sort of, and you know, you kind of want it a little soft, you know, you don't want it to, New And this is the last slide on this. Um, so books from circulating libraries uh, really didn't have much respect among book collectors because they were, you know, circulating library, they were public libraries and these books just sort of went through so many hands. They were begun by the booksellers in London as more or less advertising devices um, to advertise their latest publications. How beautiful to a genuine lover of reading are the sullied leaves, however, Lamb says. So he's taking contrary view and worn out appearance, nay, the very odor of an old circulating library, Tom Jones or Vicar of Wakefield, two very popular at the time novels. Um, how they speak of the thousand thumbs that have turned over their pages with delight of the lone sempstress after her long day's needle toil running far into midnight when she has snatched an hour ill spared from sleep to steep her cares as in some Lethean cap, cup in spelling out their enchanting contents. Who would have them a whit less soiled? What better condition could we desire to see them in? So again, rather than the pristine copy that a, a, you know, a certain kind of collector might appreciate, this kind of sentimental collector that Lamb represents really appreciates the signs of of other life, other readers, and in particular, people who would have to borrow books from circulating libraries because they didn't have money to do otherwise. Now, lastly, Lamb said that not all books are books. So he catalogs a whole list of books that are not books. He calls them biblia, a biblia. He, and, and this catalog, he says, I reckon court calendars, directories, pocket books, draft boards, bound and lettered at the back, scientific treatises, almanacs, statutes at large, the works of Hume, Gibbon, Robertson, Beatty, and Somjins, and generally all those volumes which, quote, no gentleman's library should be without. I confess that it moves my spleen to see these things in books' clothing perched upon shelves like false saints, usurpers of true shrines, intruders into the sanctuary, thrusting out the legitimate occupants. And, you know, there is some truth to the idea that the gentleman's library was a phenomenon that was largely for show. And so people would have just long shelves of, you know, encyclopedias, but in such gorgeous bindings that unless you got really close, you know, you might be impressed, right? So 
so Lamb was these ideas about, you know, what books, you know, the book theory call it, entered the U.S. And so we have here, for example, the first, this is the precursor to the Library of America. Um, uh, Edver, Ed, <laughs> Everett Doikink's Library of Choice Reading and Library of American Books were series that attempted to make high quality reading available to the American public, whether from Europe or from the US. And in this case, the motto is books which are books, right? <laughs> and in case you thought that that quotation was a tautology, right? You know, Lamb's name is on there to suggest where it comes from. Um, so the kind, this kind of um, collecting is known as sentimental collecting, and it was pioneer, pioneered in the U.S. rather than the U.K. Sentimental collecting involved books that had connections to other famous people, so association copies or authors in the form of presentation copies, um, and also like uh, recent literary figures. This was a new kind of collecting. It sounds really common now, but it was pioneered by American collectors who really couldn't compete for the old books with the old world. So what really kind of distinguishes a sentimental collector is the associations that cluster around a book. So here's Hunt, one of Lamb's uh, fellow essayists. If there be one word in our language, beyond all others, teeming with delightful associations, books is that word. It was Hunt that we know just recalls seeing Lamb give a kiss to an old folio. And then Hazlitt's on reading old books uh, talks about the old associations. And this is such a gorgeous lyrical passage that I actually want to read the whole thing. Hazlitt really gives voice to the sense that our subjectivity, our identity is, can be formed through reading and that going back to our earliest memories often, you know, can, these things can be accessed through books. So not only are the old ideas of the contents of the work brought back to my mind in all their vividness, he says, when he reads old books, but the old associations of the faces and persons of those I then knew as they were in their lifetime the place where I sat to read the volume, the day when I got it, the feeling of the air, the fields, the sky, return, and all my early impressions with them. This is better to me, those places, those times, those persons, and those feelings that come across me as I retrace the story and devour the page are to me better far than the wet sheets of the last new novels. I not only have the pleasure of imagination and of a critical relish of the work, but the pleasures of memory added to it. It recalls the same feelings and associations which I had first reading it and which I can never have again in any other way. Stan and then here comes what I think is just the most lyrical um, uh, moment. <laughs> uh, they, standard productions of this kind are links in the chain of our conscious being. They bind together the different scattered divisions of our personal identity. They are landmarks and guides in our journey through life. They are pegs and loops on which we can hang up or from which we can take down at pleasure the wardrobe of a moral imagination. Um, okay, so that's, I'm just keeping my eye here on the clock. Okay, so that's the type of bibliography as writing about books that has resulted today in uh, forms of book journalism beyond the book review, still ongoing. And again, thinking of sentimental book collecting, uh, here's a copy, for example, an American collector bound or rebound um, Lamb's copy of John Cleveland's poems. And we have the author, the date, the title, and then Charles Lamb's copy, right? Like, if anyone were to miss the cultural capital associated with this volume, you know, the spine proclaims it in gilt letters. This book is now in the, um, the Berg Collection of the New York Public Library. Now, the contrast to this kind of collecting is the bibliomania that preceded American bibliomania. So bibliomania of, say, maybe 1800 through, say, 
the 1820s. Uh, were the high ages uh, age of British book collecting when a lot of these old massive uh, collections from aristocratic households were sold at auction. And the value of those books was their antiquity and their rarity. And things like, uh, say, a copy of William Caxton, who was Britain's, one of Britain's first printers, you know, was highly valued for that reason. This is Caxton's edition of William Chaucer. Um, but for American collectors, and this is George Templeton Strong, he was a New York diarist and a bibliomaniac and somebody who uh, really kind of chronicles uh, early New York before the war, uh, says that for him, rarity adds to the value of what's good, but alone it's nothing. And he says, the technical bibliomania, the pure abstract delirium dibdinianum that rages after those things simply as book varieties, independently of any interest attaching to the edition, I never was smitten with to any great extent. And what is the dibdinianum uh, type of collecting? It's associated with um, Thomas Frognall Dibdin, who was a bibliographer contemporary with Charles Lamb, who also was responsible for renovating the field of bibliography as a literary art. You can just see, like going down his list of bibliographical publications, that he's sort of troping on different types of literary genres. So um, this would be a catalog, this an annotated catalog first, the specimen of the British Library. Um, but then we have Bibliomania or Book Madness, which was a mock medical treatise about this madness. Um, there were typographical uh, antiquities, right, uh, on the model of the antiquarian, uh, say, Tor. Uh, bibliography of poem was intended to be an epic. Um, he only finished one book of it, but uh, there was a dialogue in the form of the bibliographical Decameron, which is basically a three-volume work, enormous three-volume work on one book. And it was, at the time, the most expensive book in the world. It was the Waldorfer um, Decameron, which is the book that the Roxburgh Club of London was founded to commemorate the sale of that book in 1812. And Dibden recounts the story. Um, you have bibliographical, antiquarian, and picturesque tours. Uh, you have remin like a bibliographical autobiography, his reminiscences of a literary life, etc. So he was an extremely creative and eccentric bibliographer who was criticized for not being as accurate as he could have. You know, he would take, say, illustrations out of context and use details and not give the information, but he was a very creative bibliographer who reinvented the genre. So here is his uh, first, this is the book that popularized the bibliomania. It's called the bibliomania or book madness, um, containing uh, an account of the history, symptoms, and cure of this fatal disease. Um, and then you have a picture of the book fool dusting his books, right? Because he doesn't even know really what's in them. Um, Still, I am busy books assembling, says the book fool. These are lines quoted from The Ship of Fools, an early modern text based on this idea of the ship of state. It takes all fools to make up a state, and so one of these fools is the book fool. Still I'm busy books assembling, for to have plenty it is a pleasant thing in my conceit, and to have them always in hand. But what they mean, I do not understand. And there he is with his fool's cap, you know, like sort of just sort of uh, gloating over the beauty of his books uh, as objects. And you can see how Dibden's put like book madness in the Gothic type in red, like early, right? Um, what is this? This is, pi oh, the whole joke here is that he quotes these lines on his title page, but he doesn't attribute them to their author. He doesn't even attribute them to their English translator he attributes them to the printer, right? So this, these lines are from Pinson's Ship of Fools, 1509 edition, right? Only a bibliomaniac could care about such a thing, and clearly he's one of them. So it's a very tongue-in-cheek kind of thing. 
um, that's Pinson, right? So he's, the, he's a very, very early printer who introduced Roman type into printing as opposed to the earlier black letter. So you can see that's his edition of the Ship of Fools, the, the title there. Um, or the other, of course, being italic from places like the Venetian Aldine Press. And this is the book from which those lines are, are derived, Sebastian Brandt's Das Narrenschiff, or the Ship of Fools. And you can see the fools are come in all kinds. The translator was Alexander Barclay of the 1509 edition. And this is uh, um, Durer's representation of the book Fool. And so there he is. He's, you see the shelves of books behind him in this case, and you also see his desk littered with books, large books, folios, whereas you only really get a detail here. And that's the kind of thing that Dibden was criticized for. But he's really showing this, which is um, the, uh, this is the watermark of the first paper makers. It was, uh, and this is where we get fool's cap from, the term that defines a certain paper size, because there was this book fool in the paper, and you think about like why they chose that. Well, the guy loves books, but he also loves the material qualities of the books, and he can appreciate paper. You know, he can appreciate my product as well as literary, you know, verse. It becomes, in 1811, a different kind of a book. Bibliomania or Book Madness, a bibliographical romance this time. And there's this idea built into it of the quest after the ideal book, right? Like, you know, the romance uh, is, is, you know, there are all sorts of bibliographical romances, whether it was after, you know, the only edition of the Bay Psalm book in the U.S., or the first folio or what have you, there's this holy grail quality to a collector who really wants a certain book and will stop at nothing to get it. Um, so here you go from the book Fool to the Bodleian Library to the reader, right? You have this pile of old books. And then in 1842, um, the last edition has, does away with all the books on the title page this time. Um, this is a bibliographical romance with the woodcuts converted into far more beautiful uh, or far more finely engraved books. And he's going for more and more of this idea of like finesse, that bibliomania is a kind of art form more so than a, you know, a, a madness or a disease. It was addressed to this guy, Richard Heber, who some of you may know. He's known as the fiercest bibliomaniac of his day, but also ever. Um, he, a lot of bibliomaniacs made history for filling an entire house with books and having to like buy a new one to live in. But he, he filled nine houses with books, <laughs> including Hodnett Hall, which was his ancestral estate in Shropshire, uh, two homes in London, his town home in Pimlico, where he died, and then places where he went to buy books. So he had a house in Paris, Louvain, Leiden, The Hague, Brussels, Antwerp, and they were all completely stuffed with books. And Dibden, who was his bibliographer, well, not really, uh, but to whom he addressed the bibliomania, uh, saw the home in Pimlico after uh, Heber died and said, I had never seen rooms, cupboards, passages, and corridors so choked, so suffocated with books. Treble rows were here, double rows were there. Hundreds of slim quartos, several upon each other, were longitudinally placed over thin and stunted duodecimos, resting, reaching up from one extremity of a shelf to another. Up to the very ceiling, the piles of volumes extended, while the floor was strewn with them in loose and numerous heaps. And in fact, his house was so crowded with books that when he died, um, they couldn't find his will. And it was actually Dibden who, like the lawyers went to all of his houses and shuffled through his books. And it was Dibden who was cataloging books in the room where Heber died that found on the top shelf in the third row in this dirty scrap of paper, which left some money to some of his relatives and said nothing about his books, right? 
So people were like, how is this going to go to the hammer? How are we going to cattle? This is going to take, you know, eons. And indeed, it did. And when that was dispersed, when his collection was finally dispersed in the 1830s, the book market was so flooded that book prices dropped. And the... Dibden wrote this instead of the bibliomania, the bibliophobia, right? So it, you know, at that, that's the point, like in the 1830s, mid 1830s, when bibliomania shifts across the Atlantic to the US. And if you think about this, the, here's Heber's, like one of the quotations he's most known for. Why you see, no man can comfortably do without three copies of a book. One he must have for his show copy, another he will require for his own use and reference, and unless he is inclined to part with it, which is very inconvenient, or risk injury of his best copy, he must have a third at the service of his friends. And, you know, this is exactly what the top American bibliomaniac of the era, John Lennox, uh, sorry, James Lennox, of the Lennox Library, had the same philosophy. You know, his books, once he had the edition he wanted, it was closed off in a room, then he would get one for himself, and then he would just sort of allow people to, to read them in a room and he would go and hide because he was kind of a hermit. Ultimately, he ended up sending them to Cogswell, my favorite bibliographer, um, at the Astor Library to read in the reading room there. But he didn't want any, you know, he had his books, you could look at them, but just leave me alone. I'm busy cataloging, you know. And this is what resulted from the merger of these two libraries at the end of the 19th century. The Lennox Library and the Astor Library became the New York Public Library. And again, you can see this idea of grandeur, though, with, it's, you know, with, it's kind of a mixed, mixed thing here. You've got a Renaissance ceiling, a Baroque uh, painting, uh, neoclassical arches. It sort of just doesn't matter where the, it's, it's all mixed together, right? Um, and that was common. Okay, so lastly, I'm going to end here uh, with the fact that I just said that the bibliomania shifts across the Atlantic in the 1840s are rife with it in the U.S. Um, George Templeton Strong says in 1839, New York is certainly infected with the bibliomania. And he's drawing on Dibden's idea of it as a madness. I never saw anything like the eagerness to buy and the prices given. And that's that's New York at that in 1840. That's Broadway, the main strip where all the bookstores were. Bibliomania is a kind of constitutional disease with me. I've been subject to it as long as I can remember, he says in 1842. And his ambition to build a library of, I don't remember, I think it was 10,000 books, was more than accomplished by the time of his death. And so I'll just, I guess I can <clears throat> just end there. Thanks. So that was about 50 minutes, so, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. <laughs> wow. We have time for some questions and answers, if anyone has any questions for Denise. Yeah. I mean, I've been at lectures for like decades, and your lecture just now was one of the most engaging and, and informative and really, really one of the best lectures I've ever attended on the topic. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate that. I, I, it, it was cobbled together from talks I've given at various uh, antiquarian societies, this, that. And because I can't give the same talk twice, you've got a mixture of different talks in here. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. There was about um, where she is selling her book. Where could we find this book? So I would say that, is there a way that you can, so Yale University Press is the publisher, and there's also a, a audible book version of it. And the, um, uh, the press will give a, uh, for events like this, will give a 30% discount. So I need to send you the code, but where would you put it if? Um, yeah. Yeah. No. 
No, yeah. we do not have that here. But um, yeah. yes, we will probably on the ABA website. And just so um, to let you all know too, this was recorded. This and it will go up on the ABA website probably in the next day or two. So, but we will be sure we can try and get that information, that code, because I want to get that book too. <laughs> okay, somebody Thank had a question you. here. I mean, you, you can get it on Amazon, but yeah. Well, I don't have a question, but you made my day because we, we've struggled collectively with bibliomania ourselves. Say I think more. Everybody here but, in this room probably has. <laughs> do you have a spe special area that you collect in? You go in. No. But, but what we learned. The problem with bibliomaniacs are that they're so hungry for books that it's. It's hardly ever a very narrow specialty. I mean, that's not a problem, but that's... Yeah. <laughs> what, what we did learn, however, is that we only need three copies of each book <laughs> instead of eight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's hysterical. Oh, but, okay, yeah. we have a question back here. Oh, come on back. I'm still isolating. Thank you so much for your lecture. I had a question about, in the beginning of your lecture today, you talked about um, comparing the number of volumes in, um, um, in the United States and then what was overseas. So mm -hmm. Yale had so many and then uh, Cambridge had that many and so on. Uh, was there a sense of competition with Europe um, in those times uh, for Americans collecting? Did they? Were they aware of that discrepancy, do you think? Was oh, that absolutely. a motivator? And were absolutely. they trying to be, you know, as good as the Europeans? Was that part of it? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think there was no way that they thought they could compete given how early book collecting began in Europe and where they were and, and the fact that most books had homes, you know. Um, but they were inspired by the idea of these grand libraries to do the same thing in the US, and they believed that, um, uh, number one, uh, American education would never be complete without public libraries, where people could find not just randomly books, but go in and need uh, something, say, for uh, research information and find it, that kind of a library they needed. And they also believed that, um, the American, American literature, letters, right? Writing, whether it was about history or about, about literary history or ha what have you, could not be done without those kinds of libraries. So I would say like there was inspiration there from the big European collections, but also because Americans could not compete in the 1840s uh, for, for the Dibden type of books, you know, the, because it was very hard to get old books in the U.S. You imported a lot of them, but, you know, I mean, again, these were like working men. They didn't always have the kind of ridiculous sums of money you'd need for those books at that time. So they discovered other modes, uh, uh, other areas of collecting. So they forged, as I say, uh, uh, American history collecting. So the, the historical society libraries that were cropping up in all of the states, um, that was, you know, Europe got none of, like the US grabbed up all the documents, manuscripts, objects, and books they could related to the early Puritan colonies, the French colonies, South America. I mean, their sense of American history was much longer and deeper than, the, than British North America. Um, so that was one. Another was um, uh, sort of uh, sentimental collecting connected to, say, sh uh, literary figures. So starting with Shakespeare in the mid-19th century, where you would collect not just Shakespeare editions, but objects connected to him, maybe a quarto from, you know, from the Elizabethan period. Um, and maybe a pair of gloves that were thought to belong to him, or a wooden goblet made from a mulberry tree that he planted, or a tile from his house. There were all of these relics, and books were relics, right? So in the sentimental world of collecting, which, again, American collectors pioneered, um, a book was a relic, 
it came from somebody or it came from something. It was attached to, and objects were relics. And you can see here the transfer from the kind of religious aura that attached to early religious worship to this idea of literary history being, and being the place where authority now was found. And, and divinity, Shakespeare was divine. And then later in the century uh, to uh, like the romantic poets who became wildly popular as collecting items. And in fact, the Young Book Prize this year went to a young um, book collector who collects Shelley and Byron. And that was very common, uh, but you never had anything like that before in Britain. You know, the, the attitude was that that was amateurish and that, you know, libraries really should just stock all books and it was about the book. It wasn't about, you know, who owned it. That was seen as overly sentimental. But starting in the 1870s, Britain came around and started competing back with the Americans, so. Anybody else? Here we go. Thanks. Um, you were starting to actually answer my question towards the end of that last one, but it was about this um, this idea of America as the the pioneers of sentimental collecting, and I'm just wondering if you can flesh out a little more, like how how that was seen, just like apart from Charles Lamb's writings, but you know, from what was said in in Britain. Okay. Could you just flesh that out? Yeah. Thanks. So, okay, so there's two kinds of libraries, broadly speaking. There are private libraries, and then there are institutional libraries. Private libraries uh, were of a couple of different types. As they began in the 18th century, they were part of these mammoth uh, sort of like uh, historic estates that were kind of accumulating all books as part of like a, commun like a say, European culture tradition that belonged to that estate, right? Um, so there was no personality necessarily attached to it. And that was very much like the institutional library wh whose goal was to have as many books as possible on all fields of knowledge. There was no specializing. But when the American collectors came in who didn't have, you know, aristocratic wealth um, or, or easy access to the old bookshops, um, Again, they specialized, and so sentimental collecting, you know, people could could arrange their own specialties. And so, you know, we, we have Charles Fredrickson, who, before anyone else began collecting Shelley, he decided that Shakespeare was a fraud, because there's always been debates about whether Shakespeare wrote this play or that, sold his entire Shakespeare collection, and started collecting Shelley. That was a very smart thing to do. That was a very pioneering act on his part. And he gobbled up tons of stuff that you could never get. You know, Amy Lowell, the poet, started collecting Keats. Um, the Harvard uh, collection uh, is, is, is kind of indebted to her work on that. Um, manuscripts, books, objects, um, all sorts of, I mean, it's a massive collection of original work. Um, there's also a large Charles Lamb collection at Harvard, uh, et cetera. So, you know, what these co collectors who had vision produced were collections that then were bequeathed in toto, really, to an institutional library and remain there today. And that's how the uh, American University Libraries got built. Also, special collections is a U.S. phenomenon because... Um, if you, again, think about fetishizing an old book, well, Americans did it unabashedly and set aside these special books and special collections, whereas, you know, the Bodleian or the British Museum, they were all, they were all on a kind of even plane. It would be beneath their dignity to, to ogle, you know, an old book. <laughs> so many, right? Um, yeah. Does that answer? I don't know. It's a good research topic. It's interesting. Yeah. We have time for one last question. And I think you have. 
So, uh, who are the who are the bibliomaniacs of current day, <sighs> and how has I guess the center of gravity of this changed over a couple of centuries with the mass production of books? Like, is the interest in the types of things that people are collecting very different now? And who are the major private collectors? I guess. Yeah, I was afraid someone was going to ask me that. You're not the first person to ask me that. Um, I don't, I'm not like of the contemporary moment, uh, really. How, <laughs> however, um, I do know that since the publication of this book, the bibliomaniacs have been coming out of the woodwork and have found me. Um, so they're out there. And uh, I would say that you could probably, if you if you want a historical arc, trace a movement from the kinds of collectors I'm talking about here that are trying to build up all sorts of libraries for the sake of self-education, and they're doing it as a part of like a civic mission, to the end of the 19th century and early 20th, where you had you know the J.P. Morgans and the uh, Huntington Library and those kinds of libraries uh, built up from basically the kind of wealth that had been accumulated to match, say, a very wealthy British buyer, if that makes sense. And so just, again, accumulating massive collections. And then as you move on from there, right, through the 20th century, uh, you again get people finding that they need to because the robber baron era, like after that, um, people started specializing again on, you know, I might have a collection of books on sports, or you can walk in here and see, you know, a collection on Sherlock Holmes or travel literature. Um, that was a 20th century um, phenomenon. And today, I don't know. I mean, it's, you think it's kind of a new thing where the mass produced books are going to change everything, but like for these mid 19th century people, mass produced books were a problem because for the first time you had books on cheap paper, you had not until later in the 19th century dime novels, but you certainly had railroad literature, you know, books you could pick up like cheapo, you know. Um, and there's so there's been that phenomenon the whole time. Uh, and I think the antiquarian book is much more connected to a history in which people recognize that the past has to be recognized in order to move forward. Like, if we're going to do nation building, which they were doing in the 1840s, then they had to have some idea of what came earlier. Um, versus uh, presentism, basically. Um, you know, the old books were necessary to understanding the past. So you could be like Emerson and say, oh, we'll just throw off the past, you know. But all you have to do is go to Emerson's own library in Concord, and you'll see that he hardly threw off, you know. His, his library is a very impressive library. He didn't just walk out on his lawn, you know, and be inspired, right. So I would say that the two, you know, it's the same thing in universities today. Like, does a historical consciousness, is that necessary for an education? You know, some people would say, well, I can study design, and what does a historical consciousness have to do with my world, you know? But, well, I mean, those of, those of us who think about culture as something other than capitalism would say, you need a sense of the past, and old books are connected to that. So. Thank you. Thank you. And Denise, will you be uh, available? We have to wrap it up in here now, but would you be available yeah. um, a little bit if people wanted to come up? And Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Denise Gigantes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.